Welcome to this proof of concept video. Today our goal is to develop a visual tool to gain some intuition for addition and multiplication modulo n. I hope you've watched our previous video, the Modular Arithmetic User's Manual, link in the description below, so that you're adept to performing modular arithmetic before we start. When we work modulo n, our universe is finite. We have just n numbers in our universe. I'll use the notation z mod nz for the integers modulo n. This has two operations, addition and multiplication. So, for example, here's our world modulo 3. I'll call its three elements 0, 1, and 2. As we saw in the video modular arithmetic under the hood, these are really equivalence classes, but the most convenient way to write them is just like integers. Okay, what you see here is two tables, an addition table and a multiplication table. So, for example, 1 plus 2 is 0 mod 3, and 2 times 2 is 1 modulo 3. Okay, so this is the full information for the universe modulo 3. So everything we might want to know about z mod 3z is a consequence of this finite list of facts. In the description below the video, you'll find a link to a web page which will generate any addition or multiplication tables you might want to look at, um, as well as some other tools for exploring modular arithmetic. All right, so what's our goal for today? So the goal is to develop a tool which can get us some intuition for the operations modulo n. Think of the usual integers. So there we have some intuition that helps us out. So for example, one thing we rely on is the ability to estimate. So for example, we know that a three digit number multiplied by a three digit number is likely to be around five digits long. We also recognize certain patterns. So for example, if you add two odd numbers, you know the result will be even. But in modular arithmetic, size appears to have less meaning. So sometimes big things can add up to small things. For example, 50 plus 50 can actually just be 0 modulo 100. And if you work mod 5, for example, even an oddness are out the window. The even integer 6 is actually equivalent to the odd integer 1 modulo 5. So, uh, so we can't use the intuition that we have for the integers, but there are still patterns to assimilate here and intuition to develop. So since our world modulo n is finite, we can sometimes sort of draw a big picture of everything at once and sometimes learn a little something from this. So here's one tool for understanding an operation modulo n. So we can look at it from the perspective of just one single element. So for example, let's look at addition from the perspective of the element 1. In other words, let's think about the function adding 1, which goes from z mod nz to z mod nz. Let's take n equals 9 for an example here. Okay, so I can draw a table of what this function does, like this. Um, notice that this is just one row from the addition table, modulo 9. And looking at this table, um, this data in table form here isn't too enlightening, but you might notice that there's a cycle happening here. In some sense, adding 1 kind of rotates the mod n clock around one notch. So instead, let's draw a picture like this. Let's draw n dots in a circle to represent the n elements of z mod nz, in this case 9. And we can label them with their names. And then let's draw an arrow from one dot to the next if adding 1 takes the first element to the second. So adding 1 to 2 takes us to 3, adding 1 to 3 takes us to 4, and so on all the way around. So now we have a picture of adding 1. We might call this a dynamical portrait of the function x goes to x plus 1. In case you aren't familiar with my notation here, this arrow that comes out of a vertical line is usually called maps to, and it's just a different way of giving the rule for the function. So what comes in on the left becomes what comes out on the right. Just a different sort of notation for a function. Okay, so this portrait is much more intuitive than the table that we drew. It shows the cyclic nature that we noticed, sort of front and center. So this is an example modulo 9. Let's see if the pattern continues for other moduli. So let's look. Modulo 3, modulo 4, modulo 8, and here's mod 12. So it looks robust. So to formalize our observation here, let's write down a conjecture. The conjecture is that the dynamical portrait of plus 1 modulo n consists of a single cycle. Why might this actually be true? Well, beginning with 0, adding 1 takes us to 1, then to 2, etc., always from x to x plus 1, and we keep going until such time as we reach n minus 1, and at that point it takes us to 0 next, and we've completed the cycle. So we can actually call this a theorem. 
We just essentially gave a proof out loud right there. All right, what about addition from the perspective of two? So let's look at the function which takes x to x plus two. Let's try a few examples of this one. So let's try mod three. So I could draw the arrows as if they're rotating two notches around the clock like this, right? So zero goes to two, two goes two notches over to one, one goes two notches over to zero. But it, it's kind of messy, so let's draw them fairly straight. So zero to two, two to one, one to zero. So there we have it. That is the dynamical portrait of addition of two, adding two, mod three. Okay, so here's mod four. Ooh, this one's interesting. So zero goes to two when you add two, and then if you add two again, you get back to zero. So there actually seem to be two separate cycles here. So let me color one of them so that you can see that. Okay, so two cycles of size two. All right, let's check out mod five. So if you follow the arrows around with your eyes here, you see this is actually one single cycle in a star shape. Here's mod six. So this one actually has two again. Let me color one of them. We've got two triangles essentially here. Let's try mod seven. All right, it might take you a moment to trace that around, but it's actually just one cycle. Mod eight, and here we have two again, like two squares at an angle from each other. So do you see a pattern? So it looks like sometimes we have two cycles, these guys right here, and sometimes we have one cycle, these ones right here. So things are already getting more interesting. So let's try our reasoning from before. Let's start a chain going from zero to two to four to six and so on. So imagine n is a general n here. So it sometimes seems that we can come back around to zero. So what might happen? We might hit n minus one, and then we have to jump over zero to one. And in that case, we would continue to three, five, seven, and so on like that until we get to n minus two this time, because we're hitting all the things we missed the first time round, right? And then we finally, from there, hit zero, because n minus two plus two is n, which is zero. So then we've completed the cycle, and we've used all of the integers mod n. So this is one of the things that could happen. But what if instead we start at zero, we go two, four, six, etc., and all the way up to n minus two? Then, if, if uh, n minus two is in the sequence that we're hitting here instead of n minus one, then the next thing that we hit is zero, and we've completed a cycle and only used half of the integers mod n. So the other half live in some other cycle. Okay, so we actually have two different cases. So what controls the difference? Well, in one case, n minus one was even, because remember we're passing up through the even integers before we make our way all the way um, past the zero on the clock. And in the other case, n minus two is even, and so we hit that one as we pass up through the evens. So this actually amounts to um, saying the two cases are actually that n is odd, since n minus one is even, or that n is even, which is when n minus two is even. Okay, so when n is even, our cycle actually only used up half of the integers mod n, but the other cycle, which goes one, three, five, et cetera, will use up the other half, all right? Okay, so we have informally proven the following theorem. If n is even, the dynamics of adding two consist of just two disjoint cycles, and if n is odd, it consists of a single one cycle. Okay, there are a lot more patterns to discover this way, but first I want to connect this back to the notion of a function. So um, remember that the function we're thinking about, that we're drawing a picture of, is a function from z mod nz to z mod nz. In our case, we were just looking at f of x is x plus two. So what we saw in both of the previous examples was um, a dynamical portrait made of cycles. So sometimes it was one big cycle, sometimes it was several cycles. So now I just want to think about functions whose portraits are cycles. So something looks like this, some number of cycles. Then in each case, each integer or residue modulo n is involved in just one cycle. So it has one in arrow and one out arrow. If you just sort of zoom in on one of the elements, that's what you're gonna see. So one out arrow is the only way this could ever be because each integer only goes one place under your function. But one in arrow is actually very special behavior. So let's think about the possible in arrow cases in a dynamical portrait. So you could have no in arrows. You could have one in arrow or you could have more than one in arrow, okay? 
If there's at most one in arrow everywhere, then that means that the function is injective because we never have two inputs going to the same place. Okay, so this is actually picking up injectivity of the function. On the other hand, if there's at least one in arrow everywhere, so that's this case, then that means the function is surjective because every element is the output of something. There's nothing that is, uh, is not hit by an arrow. So the overlap case in the middle, exactly one arrow coming in at every point means that the function is bijective. And conversely, a function being bijective actually means that each number in this dynamical portrait has exactly one in arrow. So it's actually the case that if there's exactly one in arrow everywhere, then it has to look like some collection of cycles. Um, so not, for example, a tree or something more complicated like that. Okay, so we have a theorem. So let f from z mod nz to z mod nz be a function. Then f is a bijection if and only if its dynamical portrait consists of cycles. So we had a little informal discussion about this, but we didn't really actually prove this. Let's prove this. Okay, so actually let me start with a proof sketch to give the, the big structure before we write it all out in sentences. So let's first record two facts that we've outlined. So first of all, in our sketch, um, every element has one out arrow. That's just because it's a function. Um, so it looks like that. And then second, there's one in arrow at each element. So every element has one in arrow, if and only if the function is bijective. Okay, so that's what we were just discussing. And, and we explained why that is true a moment ago. So let's take these two things as given in the course of our proof. Now what we actually want to prove, right, is that this is an if and only if theorem. So we're proving the equivalence of the fact that f is bije uh, bijection with um, its dynamical portrait consisting of cycles. So we'll begin by showing one direction. If the dynamical portrait consists of cycles, then the function is bijective. Okay, so if it consists entirely of cycles, then zooming in on any one element, we see one in arrow and one out arrow, right? So if we've got cycles, everything looks like this when we zoom in. So by the work above in, in number two, that means that it's bijective. So this direction we're already actually done. So now let's consider the converse. So the other direction of the if and only if. So here we're going to assume the function is bijective and we want to prove that its portrait looks like cycles. So let's assume that it, um, that it's bijective and um, then again by number two above if we zoom in on any one element we see one in arrow and one out arrow. So this implies that if we start at one element and we go out following the arrows from there we're going to get a chain. Right? There's no branching we just get a chain heading out from that element. But here's the thing there's only finitely many elements mod n. So this chain can't have new elements forever. Instead, it has to wrap back around and hit one of the earlier elements at some point. But it can't hit one of the elements in the middle because that would entail having two in arrows at that element. So the only one that it has room to hit, the only one it can hit, is the one we started with. So we actually get a cycle. So every element is part of a cycle and the whole portrait is made of cycles. All right, so that's the argument. And now I want to give a description. Um, I, want to, I want to give a formal proof of this. Okay. So at each element of z mod nz, there is one out arrow in the dynamical portrait since f is a function. That was our point one on the last slide. There is at least one in arrow if and only if f is surjective. So this is what we had as our discussion before we started the theorem. Um, and this is just an interpretation of the meaning of the definition of surjective. There is at most one in arrow if and only if f is injective, right? Because there's no collisions with injectivity. So there is exactly one in arrow at every point if and only if f is bijective. Okay. So now it's an if and only if theorem, so we'll do the two parts. So here we're going from... Um, cycles to being a bijection. If the portrait consists of cycles, 
then every element has exactly one in arrow. So f is bijective. All right, using what we had above, let's do the converse. So conversely, if f is bijective, then every element has exactly one in arrow and one out arrow. All right, great. But then why does that mean we're in a cycle? So we have to do a little bit more work here. So heading out from one element, there's a chain until a repeat occurs. A repeat must occur because there are finitely many elements. A, the repeat cannot occur at B, C, D, etc. because it would entail two in arrows. Therefore, the repeat occurs at A, so a cycle is formed. Thus, every element lives in a cycle, which means that the portrait consists of cycles and we are done. Okay, great. So, um, so this is interesting. So we've, we've talked about the bijectivity and how to see that in the picture. So it looks like cycles. That's a good starting point. But notice that um, we picked up much more, a much more detailed pattern when we looked at addition uh, of two mod n and its dynamical portrait. We noticed that sometimes there are two cycles, sometimes there were just one, right? So, um, so why is that the case? So that's the next thing that we'd like to prove, how many cycles of what size and why. So we can ask this about addition. So um, we could, uh, so yeah, how many cycles and of what size? We could ask about functions f of x equals x plus a, but also about multiplication. So functions f of x equals ax. So in the description, you'll find a link to an interactive worksheet meant for an in-class exploration. This is supposed to be the starting point. But just as a teaser here, let's see a couple of examples with multiplication. So this is the dynamics of times 5 on z mod 6z. So 0 when you multiply it by 5 is 0, 1 when you multiply it by 5 is 5, but 5 when multiplied by 5 is 25, which is 1 more than a multiple of 6, so that goes to 1, and so on. So we get this. And now you notice we have different size cycles, several different cycles, so that's already looking kind of interesting. But now get a look at this one. If we do the dynamics of times 2 on z mod 6z, then, well, everything looks like it goes crazy. In fact, we don't have cycles. So looking at this, from what we've learned already, we can see that, in fact, this isn't even bijective. So this is actually doing something very different. So this one is a bijection. This one is not a bijection. So there's definitely a lot of interesting structure to describe when we look at the dynamics of multiplication. Okay, now I want to make one more quick comment about... Um, these pictures, which is that I've chosen to draw the dots in a circle around like this, but you certainly don't need to do that. So for example, taking a look at this um, diagram on the right, it's actually perhaps more organized if I were to put it this way on the screen. So I've just moved the dots around, but it actually conveys the exact same information about what goes to what under the map. Um, and so there's nothing about the dynamical portrait that requires that you place the dots in a particular place. In this video, I've just made the, I've, ha I've had the habit of placing them in a circle, but you certainly don't need to. Okay, one final comment, actually, which is that um, you should take a look at the links below the video. Soon I'm going to put up another video showing some of the cool pictures that you can get by looking at um, dynamical portraits with computer software. Um, and uh, there's also, th this is something many people have done, so you'll find some other cool videos on YouTube if you search around for this sort of thing too. Um, so this is just a starting point. So go forth and explore. Check the links in the description to the video. Thank you.